Gresham College presents Reducing Inequalities in Child Health, Part 2 What Can We Do That's Positive? By Professor Danny Dorling, the University of Sheffield. So after that fabulous kickoff um, from Helen there, we're now moving on um, to Danny Dorling, um, which A, is a great alliterative name, um, so um, that's fabulous. Um, but also, Danny has a, a really interesting role. He is the Professor of Human Geography. Now, uh, but the way back when, when I was doing geography, we didn't talk about human geography or any other sort of geography, so I am absolutely fascinating to see um, what insights Danny can bring um, to this, thinking about um, inequalities in child health in the UK, what we know and what do we need to know. So Danny, take it away, please. In about 25 minutes, I think, what can we do that's positive? I'm going to start off with some bad news, particularly for the young people in the room. Uh, they're entering a period where economically the income gaps and the wealth gaps between them are going to be as great as in their great-grandparents' time. The time of upstairs, downstairs, the time of Downton Abbey, the time when the most common occupation for a woman in Britain was to work in service. Uh, your parents and your grandparents had it good. Um, not necessarily materially good. They would have gone cold because they didn't have central heating. They certainly didn't have mobile phones and so on. But they lived for a time when we came together. We're, we're now moving apart again, and that is going to be a large problem. In terms of uh, things like health, the life expectancy gap between areas you showed on the tube line, you have this five-year gap. Between the whole of Glasgow and, say, somewhere the size of Kensington, it's now a 12, 13, 14 year gap. Uh, between one estate in Sheffield and another, it's a 19-year gap. And that gap, that life expectancy gap, is as wide or wider than it last was in the 1920s. People live much longer now, but where you live, your postcode matters as much as when your great-grandparents were alive. Uh, there is lots of good news, and I'm going to generally be positive, um, but please note, my aim is to be positive, so don't have a go at me because I haven't gone for everything that's terrible, <laughs> which people often do when I do this. Um, but we often tend to miss the things that are positive. Here's a, one of the last government's two main targets for health. Uh, we're kind of moving back in time. This is a mortality target. The, the Provost work, uh, which helped show us, I think, that the Victorians didn't necessarily help make the poor much better off when you measure the heights of their children, um, was more sophisticated than, than this. But this is one of the two government targets on health. One target is to reduce the gap between areas. Um, which we've had since Margaret Thatcher signed up to that target in 1985, and that has so far failed. That target may be reached. We might actually start seeing the gap between areas get better soon, mainly because people can't get out of poor areas uh, now because the mortgage market has, has done so badly. But this target is interesting. This is the infant mortality target, the main child health target of the country. And it's the gap in mortality between babies born to working class parents where at least you've got a father registered, and the average. And you'll see that when the target was set shortly after 1997, it got worse and worse and worse, the gap grew. It then kind of plateaued, but in the last two years, it's almost, or it's almost hit the aim of getting it down to 10%. That is 10% more working class babies dying than middle class babies. Um, and it's good news. So we've had a reduction in, in infant mortality. The reason I have the caveat, um, and I won't say much more about this because I don't know much more about this, but the timing is worryingly coincidence with baby P and the large number of uh, children who are taken into care at that time. Uh, and the downside of, of that is that we know that children taken into care, those who are not adopted later, can ha have some of the worst health profiles. So you save them in the short term, but in the long term. Things are not so good. I'm going to skip through quite a lot of slides. I won't be able to explain them all, but I do want to keep the time. I do want you to give you a chance to ask me questions. I'm going to warn you even earlier that I want questions. Um, some things are getting much worse. We have the highest rate of imprisoning people in, in Europe, and it's going up. And not everything is related to inequality. But I'll say that because I'm going to give you a lot on inequality in a minute. Um, 
but the prison population curve is related to something else. During that time of incredible inequality, 1900, 1910, 1920, we managed to have mass inequality in Britain and not in prison huge numbers of people. This graph is out of date, by the way. Since the riots, we've had an incredible increase in the rate at which we imprison people. Average age of people in prison, almost children, early 20s, when it's the early 20s. 7% of all school-aged children in Britain have had a father in prison. Um, this is a figure that is simply not recognised on most of the continent. We have children still imprisoned in various ways. We're supposed to have uh, children who are being deported, not being imprisoned, but that's still going on. Uh, in some Nordic countries, the minister responsible for looked after children who have committed crimes personally signs off against the ten names every month and knows who those children are. Uh, one problem of living in Britain is you often don't realise that far better things and situations are possible and are happening in other places. However, being positive, uh, I think it's positive that we get viral uh, internet poster campaigns like this. I think we've seen an increased level of dissent and people not uh, behaving themselves again, and I think this is helpful. Uh, on the comment about David Cameron endorsing the Spirit Level book, my personal prejudice on this is that if David Cameron was a really clever man, he would have endorsed it, he would have stuck to it, he would have gone for One Nation Toryism, outflanked Labour, made his name in history, kept true to his past and his mother's cousin's belief, who's Ferdinand Mount, who's written a book called The New Few, and would have wiped the floor politically in Britain and we would have all come together a little bit more um, if he was really clever. But he's not that clever. <laughs> uh, I'm a bit mean, but <laughs> he got a first. Lots of people get first. And I, I get first. And that's, and that, um, I do think it's strange in Britain that he was taught to do the same course as, as the leader of the opposition. We're a very, very narrow, narrow country. Whether you get a first depends on whether Vernon Bognador likes you. But I'll, I'll shut up then, and if I get myself in any more trouble. Um, but dissent, dissent rising. When did we last see dissent rising? It was in a different way in the past. Here's another one of these viral posters I like so much. I do almost feel sorry for Stephen Hester now uh, and his image being put up there. And we know his parents were not proud of him taking that much money. Uh, this is a hospital consultant drawn in the size of his salary. It's a police sergeant drawn in the size of her salary and down the person at the bottom is so small we can't even read what their occupation is. That's the vast majority of people. Um, this picture came out in 1936. It's very famous. Those two boys are from Harrow, the same school as Winston went to. You can tell from the cane. If you ever want to spot Harrow Eaton differences, look for the cane. The cane means Harrow. The three working class boys are looking slightly cheekily at them. That photo is so famous because of that look and because the paper printed it. Um, it was the centre of, of that time and about that time and about what was going on in the 1930s. In many ways, we're back to the 1930s when it comes to a period after a crash and when it came to changing attitudes. And this is where I'm hopeful because the 1930s were an incredibly good time, as I'm going to try and argue with you, for things getting better. It's just that hardly anybody noticed at the time. And partly because they didn't notice at the time things got better because they carried on being angry. And this is one of the problems we have. If you get complacent and you just say, oh, it'll all be okay, it won't be okay. If you get angry and make it okay, then it will, but you're not going to be happy while you're angry doing it. Um, you've read about what Oswald the banker said about Keynes. What he was really doing was expressing the outrage, the anger that came after 1929 and when it became clear by 1933 things were not going to get back together again. We're at the equivalent point in 1933 now. We're four years after the crash. It hasn't gone back, has it? Right? At what point are you going to realise that the desperate attempts to go back to normal are not going to work? Here's an inequality graph. Um, I filled in uh, some of the gaps on this, but you'll spot the white line. The white line is the, is the richest of the rich, the top 1% of the 1%. Around about the time of Downton Abbey, they were getting 400 times mean 
average incomes. We have this incredible equalization after the Titanic goes down with the First World War in the 1920s, in the 1930s. Half of it's achieved before the Second World War. You do not have to have a world war to become more equal. This is very good news, particularly if you're young. <laughs> it then carries on down until my childhood in the 1970s. Uh, by the time I was age 10, somebody in the top 1%, I always say banker, but it's wrong, because then bankers were normal. They just ran banks, banks were boring, didn't make much money. Somebody in the top 1% in 1978 only got six times average income. Um, that's what you get over in Scandinavia now. That existed in this country when this hall was still here. The world didn't stop. And you can see the rise again, and maybe a little sign of hope towards the end of the rise. When you're incredibly unequal, as we were in the 1920s and 1930s, the way people treat each other and behave to each other changes. But of course you don't notice it because it's normal. You walk around not seeing the little people who sort out the chairs or clean the room or do this and that if you're a top person. If you're a little person, you keep your eyes down and you don't look the big people in the eye because they're above you. Currently in London, the poorest of the best 10% of Londoners is 273 times richer than the best off of the poorest tenth. Okay? So at the extremes, 10% and 10%, 273 times richer. That means if you're from London and you're young in this room, you really can't bring somebody home from that opposite end of the scale. You can for a little bit, but it's going to get terribly, terribly embarrassing. Um, I won't dig any further into that, but this, this causes huge problems. It creates almost caste differences. It, it divides us very badly. There's some stuff for you to read there about, about recent trends. The reason I've put it up, apart from it's great that people don't look at me because I really don't like people looking at me, and that's why I do graphics, um, is that most jobs for young people have been reducing. This is people under 25 recently. Um, except for working on tables. Waiters and waitresses went up in the last couple of years. But you'll see here the amount of money you get paid for waiting on tables um, is going down. <laughs> one last one of these graphs. Uh, this is what the top 10% get. It was about 50% towards 1920. You'll see it drop to 30% and you'll see it rising again. Um, but in fact, the gap between there and there is narrowing. This may be good news. The people just beneath the 1% the who are here are not doing so well. Um, but let's get off that and on to other things. The United States. If you want to know what this country would look like if it becomes much more unequal, and especially for children, especially for people going hungry, there are 30 million people on food stamps in the States and rising. The United States is a country which imprisons the most people in the world. Two million people are imprisoned at any one time in the States. There's only one country in the world that comes close to the US, and that's Rwanda. And the Ru Rwanda only comes close to the United States for its rate of imprisoning people, because that includes the men accused of war crimes. Um, it is a shocking situation to, to look at, at life in the United States and the point that it's got to. There are many, many areas of California where your newborn child is far more likely to end up in prison by the age of 18 or 19 than they are to end up in university. Um, and there will soon be parts of Britain where we'll be able to draw this line. And we'll be able to say, here, if you have a child, if it's a boy, there are odds on to be in prison, not to go to university. Um, now, I'm not saying that all prison... <laughs> I won't get into what everybody should do. One point of putting up the US graphs is that they really did achieve their great equality during the Second World War and after that in the 1950s and 60s. And one problem with that for us is that we've kind of learned this message and we, we think it's wartime, but it wasn't for us. It was 20s and 30s, and so we don't learn from the 1930s enough to see that things can get better. Great things did happen in the war, the reason why Winston Churchill didn't just proceed over the period of the fewest numbers of babies dying, but over the biggest drop ever in infant mortality in this country, 
was that we suddenly became dramatically more equal in this country and people got rationed so that even if you're in the bottom of society, you got enough food uh, to get through. The kind of changes that happened during the 1930s, when there's somebody like William Beveridge, who was a eugenicist at the start of the 1930s and believed that some people just were never going to amount to very much, ended up around about 70 years ago from today chairing a committee that brought in the welfare state. Um, incredible changes at the very top, at the most elite part of society, people changed their beliefs. That's why I say about if David Cameron was really clever, they would have seen that move. And I don't think I'm not being mean, I, I, don't, I think he's clever enough. Not clever enough to take on David Letterman, as he thought he was, on US TV. <laughs> But it's clever enough, and I don't actually put it past this current government actually slipping in a way to the left that you won't notice them doing. Um, partly out of desperation, um, because if you're trying to raise more money in the future, you just can't carry on cutting anymore. If you need another 80 billion in future, it's obvious where the 80 billion is, and it's not from the poor. And there's nobody better qualified than George Osborne to find it. Um, and he find it well. And I, I don't think it's impossible. There's a graph of wage inequality, of wealth inequality, fittingly at the right time. I'll say nothing more than that because I do want to end on time. And there's a complicated graph that I'm going to skip. It's for nerds. If anybody's very nerdy and worried about why I'm going on about the 1%, it's because the 1% tell you about overall inequality. When the 1% have a lot, you're unequal. Here's life expectancy versus how much the 1% have got. You'll see a general relationship. Countries have become very inefficient when the top 1% get more and more and more. In America, they're heading towards 20% of all income. That leaves everybody else with 80%. In effect, they're on a GDP of 80%. All kinds of things go wrong. On the Today program this morning, there's a US academic forecasting that by 2020, American society will break down as, as a result of, of this. Um, more equal countries do better, have higher life expectancies, things are better worked out. Denmark. Thankfully, for anybody who wants a traditional public health message, uh, you can't just be more equal and be lovely to each other and write wonderful poetry and have the most amazing schools in the world and so on and so on and still smoke. Right? <laughs> the Danes, at least the older Danes, do like their cigarettes, which is why Denmark comes off, off the line. Yeah. Uh, mental health, this is how much the top 1% get and this is the percentage of the entire population suffering from a mental health problem according to WHO in a year, up to 25% in the USA where they take the most. And again, you'll see there's a general, general relationship there. We're not going to test it. We can't, it, you can't test these things very rigorously statistically because we don't have a whole series of planets to run different scenarios on. Like if you want to ask about that and get into it. This really is only about the last 20 years history and about a small number of very rich countries, but there do seem to be these general relationships, always with exceptions. Um, the line I always say about Australia and New Zealand is that they contain so many people who've just arrived from here that they're still suffering and haven't realised that they've turned up somewhere that's warmer. <laughs> um, two maps for you, just to show I like drawing maps. Uh, this is a map of where all the wealth is. Again, if you're trying to work out where to get money, if you need to get money, this is where it is. This is uh, where the 7% of people who pay inheritance tax die from their point of death. Um, and the wealth to go for is the land under the feet. That's the bit you can't take away. It's the land value. If, if we need to uh, raise money quickly in this incredibly rich country, uh, that's the land. If you're young in this audience, you don't tend to own the land. It's the land. Right? It's the land owned by the people older than you. That is your financial salvation. Tax it on the land value tax and let Russians come in and buy it. Um, <laughs> or alternatively, pay £9,000 a year for the privilege of going to university and pay it back at £40,000 loans. You can decide. The young get bigger and bigger as a group. The old get smaller and smaller as a group. You don't all have to go the same way. This is the inequality graph for the UK, how much the top 1% get um, from another series. This is France, very unequal in the past, everywhere was, tracks us, and then goes a completely different way from the end of the 1970s. That's the Sarkozy increase in inequality. Under Hollande, it's going down that way. Okay? Very different. 
It's not globalization. It's not inevitable. It's different in different places. This is Germany and Japan. There's nothing natural about levels of inequality in particular countries. There's nothing particularly cultural about Japan that means that it's particularly equal. People live there for a long time because of what they eat. The reason why Japan does so well is because they lost a war and an invading American army was so scared that communism would take over those islands because the state people were in, they took the land off the aristocracy and spread it out equally, making Japan a 90% middle class society that worries incredibly at the moment about this terrible rise in inequality to the richest 1% taking just over 6% of all income or what was normal when I was a child, when this country was as equal as it had ever been. The problem here, though, of course, is you can't engineer to lose a war. However, you can be like Switzerland and the Netherlands. In Switzerland and the Netherlands, the top 1% had similar very high amounts of money in the past. But watch, this is from the World Top Income Database, watch how it's gone down and down and down over time. Right. The Swiss have bankers. The Netherlands has industrial complexes and oil companies. But they made different choices. They're more homogeneous. And in the Netherlands now, you have the highest children in the world, the healthiest children uh, in the world. I just think it's important to know that different options are available. Um, I'll let you read Patrick Dunleavy's words about what's happening to young people in education. I'll say some positive things while you read the negative things there. Uh, the positive things are that up until 2010, for the first time, and we really didn't think this was going to happen, the increase in young people going to university was higher from working class households in, in absolute numbers than it was from middle class households. Um, and it was partly because the middle class were running out of extra children to, sp to send. But there really was a narrowing of the educational gap and a narrowing of GCSEs. Um, and a narrowing of attainment after 18. And partly accidentally, educational maintenance allowances were by far the most effective thing ever uh, to get people to stay on, carry on, realize that they were valued and that people actually wanted them to carry on at school and then to do something else. Uh, the minister was shocked when he saw the results, but something very different is happening now. For the first time since the 1950s, the number of people going to university is dropping. Um, and you're getting increased attitudes that say that the poor don't deserve to go, they're feckless, and, and so on. The increase, by the way, in university places for the bottom 20%, the bottom fifth of society, when Labour came in, five children went to university out of a class of 30, and when they left, six went. All that Labour did was allow one extra child in a class of 30 in the bottom fifth of society to get to university. That's the extra child too many, the one who should be a hairdresser. Okay. Cuts, I'm gonna go through this far too fast. Those are our cuts. There's a percentage of GDP, these are IMF figures, these are the cuts in the United States if Obama wins the election. If Obama doesn't win the election, it's gonna go that way. The point is that they've crossed over. And now I'm just gonna show you all the other countries in Europe and the point is not just to show you that all their cuts are less, although the Greek ones may be revised now, but to show you that other countries decide to spend a much higher proportion of GDP, raise far more in taxes. And to get to my favourite little country, Denmark, Denmark is not bankrupt. You can run things in a different way. It takes a long time to move towards that different way, but it is actually a choice. And if you don't even realise it's a choice, you're unlikely to get there. Ireland, if you've noticed. Yes. And... Uh, the best thing for Ireland is that George Osborne, most of his land's in Ireland. If you wonder why we bailed Ireland out. Um, these are inequality statistics. We are the fourth most unequal country of the 25 richest. We are more unequal by income than Israel, which is, just, which is the fifth. The same thing's up on a pretty graph. I'm going to skip past India and China. I'm going to skip past consumption. And I'm going to end up with a few good news stories to finish on. If you look outside of this country and outside of what's happened very recently, uh, then there are some incredibly good news stories and incredibly underreported. The best, biggest good news story in the world is that last year infant mortality rates fell 
by 5% in just one year, faster than they have fell in Britain under Winston Churchill, worldwide. Uh, the number of grieving parents in the world has halved since the 1970s, despite the fact that there are far more people alive now to have children. It's accelerating as the fall in infant mortality, and it's partly accelerating because people are having fewer children at an accelerating rate. So we're heading towards a world population of between 9 or 10 billion by 2050. The first stabilisation of world population outside the Americas since the Black Death. After the Black Death, again, if you're young and you think you're going to live fairly long, the price of labour rose. People were worth more. We're heading towards that globally. Uh, UNICEF came out with figures this week about how, I forget how many fewer children were dying every minute. Um, it's an incredibly good news story that's going on. And it's largely because people are choosing to have fewer children, can have them in more careful circumstances, it's easier to care for them, more availability of contraception, but largely the empowerment of women. Um, over half of all women in the world are having 2.1 or less children each. Uh, all our children on average are predicted to have only two children each, which is population stability. There are lots and lots of resources to get more economically equal and hence to achieve better health. It's almost impossible, I think, to achieve better health without being a bit more economically equal by which I only mean heading towards the average country in the OECD. I'm not talking about revolution here. I'm just talking about being averagely unequal. We've never paid ourselves more. Our wage bill has never been higher. Right? Our mean, not our median, which is what you notice when the average salaries are going down, our mean pay hasn't been higher. But most of the increase in pay has been for the top 10% of society. If you take that increase in the top 10% of society, which includes people like me, and you were to take it back to what the top 10% were paid in the 1970s, but in real terms, what that means is if you take a doctor who's now paid, say, 110 or 120,000 and paid them 50,000 pounds a year in today's money, but you do that to everybody in the top 10%, the amount of money you save allows you to hire the million young people who are not in education, training or work full-time on £7 an hour, not 5 20 full-time 10 times over. Um, so we've got an enormous, it's not a lack of money, it's not that we suddenly need more economic growth. Um, what we do need is for rich parents to be willing to share a bit more. And these are rich parents who are worried that their, their children can't get jobs. You can say the same for things like houses. I know it's good to build a few, but we've never actually had more bedrooms in this country per person. Um, the problem is we're sharing housing out worse than we've ever done before. Same for things like cars. We've got more people in Britain who have a spare car, that is more cars in their households than people aged 17 and over. Right? There are more people who've got a spare car, more cars than they can possibly drive, than there are young parents with children without a car, who are the group I think most need a, a car. Is, it's very hard to cope with nappies nowadays if you're trying to carry them all back on the bus. But yeah, there is enough of everything, but increasingly we share these things out worse and worse. If you share things out better, if you become less frightened of each other, if the gaps between you narrow, it's much easier to do many other things. If they widen, it becomes harder. When they widen, you begin to worry about the schools. You begin to move to different areas because the schools are good, so you spend more and more of your income on mortgages, which is borrowing money from very rich people. Um, you create these enclaves that are different. Poor areas become poorer. Normal to smoke in a poor area, not normal to smoke in another area. The divides widen. But also you've got all these cars driving kids all over the place and you've got parents enslaved to getting their children to school again. Children used to go to school on their own at relatively young ages. And it's largely women who are enslaved at the start and the end of the day. In more equal societies, more children go to the nearest school and go on their own. Last map, we've polarised in all kinds of ways. This is a map of voting, and it's where the, it's a change in the Conservative vote from 2001 to 2010, and I'm just putting it up to show that it went up most here and then in Essex. Um, it went up most where it was already highest to begin with. Our country's polarising politically. It's because of that polarisation that we have a coalition government. 
because it's the most inefficient increase in Conservative votes you could get. Um, what you want is for your votes to increase in the seats you're just going to win, not to have the biggest rise in votes in the seats that you already hold. But it's a sign that we're dividing apart. So, hopefully, there'll be some people in this room who think he's talking utter rubbish. Um, because if there aren't, my case wouldn't be proved. There should be some of you who only ever meet people with similar opinions to yourselves and have not heard this opinion before. Similarly, where I come from, um, it's not strictly true because I actually do come from Nick Clegg's constituency, um, but near to where I come from, people only vote Labour, don't vote. And so, but you hear attitudes like mine. I'm come down from Sheffield for the day. Final slide. We're seeing something quite remarkable happen since 2008. A lot of the remarkable things are not being noticed, almost being taken for granted now. The sacking of top bankers, Bob Dyer being sent back to the United States of America. People at the top of society on the right saying it's wrong, it's morally wrong for people to take more. Um, it's new. We're also seeing the top 9% of society, the people just below the top 1%, seeing their share of income squeezing from three times the average to two and a half times the average. And once well, that happens, once you've got an alliance between the 9% and the 90% moving more towards each other, away from the top 1%, I think there's more scope for things to occur. To me, this all matters for children's health because I cannot find anywhere on earth, in, in the rich world at least, where you don't get good children's health, you don't get mentally stable or happy children, as their parents' economic lives begin to divide and divide. And as you get children asking, at very young ages, about jobs. I've had 10, 11-year-olds asking me about jobs. It's not the kind of world you want to live in where you've got 10 and 11-year-olds worrying about whether anybody's going to want them or value them. Thank you very much for your time. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.